Hi, Acts of the Apostles. Today we're going to talk about history. You see, I've got my Sankofa birds on, which are birds that go backwards to fetch what you've forgotten in history, as even as they fly forward. Well, today we're going to talk about history and how history affects the way that we interpret texts, biblical texts. So we're going to be looking at four different kinds of history in the Acts of the Apostles. And I want you to think about history in these four different ways so that as we're reading Acts of the Apostles together and as you're thinking about them together in the forums, and by the way, you're doing amazing work in the forums. I'm really, really impressed. But as we think about um, Acts together in the forum this week, um, I want you to think about four different kinds of history. Okay, so let me think about, first of all, the first kind of history. The first kind of history is a history of the text itself. In our case, the history of Acts of the Apostles. This is something like, when was Acts of the Apostles written? Where was it written? Who wrote it? When was it written? Now, these are not settled questions, even today in the 21st century. We make those decisions based on a number of things. We make the decisions based on the oldest manuscripts we have. We make the decisions based on clues we find in those texts. Um, the Gospel according to Luke talks about the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 CE. Since we know the de destruction of Jerusalem took place in 70 CE, we know that therefore Luke Acts has to be written after the destruction of Jerusalem, so at least 80 for instance. So those sorts of questions, those sorts of ideas help you to frame when the text was written. The best way to get at the question of history of when the text itself was written is to use a commentary or to use an introduction to the New Testament. I think I might even want to have, have one over here that's a good introduction to the New Testament. But if I don't, then we can just move on. The best thing to use, though, is either a commentary or an introduction to the New Testament. Um, the idea of ha finding out the history of the text is to get a sense of when the author is writing. Because the author is writing at a particular time, the author is going to write in a particular way. If the author is writing in 21st century the United States, he or she would write differently than in the 1960s. Take, for instance, a letter from the Birmingham jail. We know a letter from the Birmingham jail is written in April 1963 by Martin Luther King Jr. and specifically written from a Birmingham jail. Well, as a, an interpreter, you can then go back and see what's going on in April 1963 in Birmingham. What is Birmingham and what's going on there? What's going on in Birmingham jails and how does that affect the way that this text might be written? Um, how was the text finalized? Was the text finalized in jail or was the text finalized out of jail? And how does that affect the way this text might be written? How does that affect what the author has to say? So all of those issues are part of the history of the text itself. So our first historical question is the history of the text. Our second historical question is the history of the context of the text, the historical context of the text. What is the historical context of the text? What's going on in the world around the text? You see, once we know the history of the text, we can start asking those questions. So once we know that, that April 1963 is the date of the text, then we can go and say, okay, what's going on around the text? So I was already moving to historical context right after I got the dating, right? Um, Brigitte Kahl's article, which you had to read, it's, I think it's listed in Robert Woodruff Library's Reserve as Chapter 8, but Brigitte Kahl's article gives a wonderful summation of the kind of history that's going on in Rome while Acts is being written. She talks about the humiliation of, of Jewish people after the destruction of Jerusalem. And Paul, remember, is a Jew. Um, Luke Acts is probably writing, the author of Luke Acts is probably writing to people that are at least partially Jewish. Um, Jerusalem has been utterly humiliated. Instead of paying a tax to the temple, Jews are being forced to pay a tax to the Roman temple, um, uh, to the god Jupiter. So they're actually having to pay tax to foreign gods as part of their um, tribute after being captured, as part of their, their penalty for having gone to war with Rome. So you've got this whole history of Rome coming down and crushing Jewish insurrectionists, crushing people that are not like them, and 
that has an impact on how Luke writes these texts. The same thing is true when we think about the letter from a Birmingham jail again. In that letter, we read the following. We have waited for more than 340 years for our constitutional and God-given rights. The nations of Africa and Asia are moving with jet-like speed toward gaining political independence, but we creep at horse and buggy pace toward gaining a cup of coffee at a lunch counter. Now, that, those two sentences are chock full of historical context, right? You have the historical context of the lunch counter sit-ins. You have the historical context of Gandhi and the independence movement in India and, and some of the independence movements going on in Africa under people like Kwame Nkrumah. You've got all of this history packed into these two lines. We've been looking for our constitutional rights for 340 years. Well, that gives you a historical context of a country with a constitution like the U.S. that says some particular things that has particular rights that the people don't have. Well, that's the same thing that's true when you're reading the New Testament. You're going to be able to find, once you find out approximately when a book is written, you can then begin to unpack what's going on during the time that book is being written. And, and so Birgitta Call's article does a really nice job of doing that for Luke Acts. The third question, the third historical question that you want to look at is what are the incidental or accidental historical markers in the text? What are the incidental or accidental historical markers in the text? What do I mean by this? Every text is going to have some clue, every historical text is going to have some clues in it that the author is not making his main point. We might not even realize as an author that we've put them in. They're just so much part of the way that we think that we've forgotten that that's actually a historical marker that can name us. Let me give you an example. In Acts chapter 18, verse 2, we find out that Paul meets in a particular city a couple named Priscilla and Aquila who have been expelled from Rome by the Emperor Claudius. That's a historic, historical event, but it's incidental in Luke Acts. It's not going to be a central focus of Luke Acts, but Luke Acts, when recording it, tells us, oh, this is a couple that's been expelled by Claudius. Well, we can go back in history and find out when was the Claudian expulsion. And so that particular incidental historical fact then helps us to date Acts and to date Paul, assuming that Acts is accurate as history. The fourth thing, the fourth kind of history is the history in the text as written by the author. In other words, what is it that the author wants us to know? How does the author tell his historical story or her historical story? How does the author shape a particular history of the Christian movement? Because not every history of the Christian movement is the same, and even the history that is told in, in Acts by, about the life of Paul is different than the history Paul himself tells about his own life in Galatians. So how are these two histories different, and therefore how can we begin to understand what the history of the author in the text is doing. Is, in fact, as Brigitte Call argues, is Luke writing a safe history? Is he writing a safe history for Romans? And if he's writing a safe history, can we see how the history that he's writing is safe? Can we see the ways in which he might be hedging a little bit or might be glossing some things over a little bit to make things look more clean, more Roman, and less like an insurrectionist movement claiming Jesus is Lord. Um, so in this week's forum, I want you to consider these things about Acts chapter 9, 10, and 11. Uh, when do we think Acts is written and by whom as a class? Uh, what impact does Acts being written at that time have on how we interpret Acts? What's going on during the time that Acts is written in the Roman world, in the Roman conquered world, in the world in which Acts says it's situated, in Damascus and in Joppa and in, in Lydda? Um, how do you know what's going on? Well, one of the things you do is you do research. Exegesis is not something you just pull out of your head. It's actually work that you go and do and research. And remember, you have a bibliography project. You have a requirement to put in three non-monographs and one monograph into the, into the bibliography at the top of the class. And there is a grade attached to that. So as you're doing research about the history of these texts, start putting what you find in the bibliography project. Third, 
What's in the history of Luke's text? Is there a historical significance to Damascus or Joppa or Lydda or Caesarea? What are these particular cities? How do we know about their history? Are there historical figures named in these cities? What's the centurion? All of these are incidental historical pieces. And how does that affect the way we read the text? And finally, what story is Luke telling? What is Luke's history? How is Luke telling a particular story of the Christian church? How does Peter fit into that? How does Paul fit into that? How does uh, Tabitha fit into that? How do all of these characters fit into this history? And is it a safe history? Might there be another history or a different history that Luke does not tell or is not telling? And as you think about your pericope, particularly for the final paper, because some of you will have turned in your original papers already, but as you think about your pericope, wonder with yourself, does it matter when Acts was written for this pericope? Are there historical facts I need to know about this pericope that I don't already know? What kind of history is Luke telling in this? Are there hints, incidental hints, about the history of this uh, text that I need to follow up on? Some of you I know are, do are doing the um, Ethiopian eunuch and the Kandaki. Who's a Kandaki? What's, what is the history of the Kandaki as queen? How do we know this? So all of this is stuff you can follow up on. So I hope this kind of brief overview gives you a sense of how we're going to deal with history this week in class, and I will see you in the forum. Take care.